for this is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. All of those who continue to drop by the church and fill the blessing block box, but also as we launch into uh, June, we have a new mission project that Elder George Bolton is going to share with you about making masks. We want to make at least 500 of these masks, and as you hear this invitation to support, we invite you now to be a part of what she is leading us and our congregation is rallying around making masks for our community. Let us watch this video. Good morning, C.N. Jenkins Church family and friends. I bring you greetings from the pastoral staff and the leaders and officers of the church. As mentioned before, our May project is the making and donation of masks. Our goal is at least 500 masks, and in order to achieve that goal, we will be hosting a mask-a-thon on May the 29th and May 30th from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. each day. So if you would like to volunteer, we need people who will be able to lay out, cut, pin, sew, and iron. If you would like to volunteer, please contact me, Joyce Bolton, at clerk at cnjenkins.org or Sharon Ross, shay, S -H -A, dot one nine six three at yahoo.com. We look forward to seeing you. We are going to be practicing all social distancing. So we have two-hour two shifts, and we don't want no more than 10 people per shift. In addition to volunteering, you have the opportunity to donate. So if you would like to donate either 400-count thread sheets, uh, any size, white or light blue, monetary donations, or if you're making masks at home, we will take those donations also. And the date to drop off those donations is May the 23rd from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Again, if you would like to help, send us an email or you can visit the church website for more information. When you enter life apart from God and his grace, that's isolation. When God comes to see you, that's visitation. And when he unveils the mysteries of eternity, that's revelation. When you think of his marvelous goodness, that's called meditation. When you expect to see him, that's anticipation. When you feel his spirit moving on the altars of your heart, that's motivation. When you share in kingdom building, that's participation. When you tell of his goodness and his mercy, that's recitation. When you glorify him and praise him, that's celebration. And when all of these things belong to your experience, you can't help but to shout. And you'll have to say, and you may do like others do, but you'll do something. You'll open up. You'll let go. You'll give vent to the spirit. You'll let the overflow flow. Oh, you may not jump up and down, but you'll shed a tear. You may not cry but you are pat a foot. You may not pat a foot, but you will clap your hands. Something will happen. Something will move you. Something will touch you. You will feel something. So you can say, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God that spoke to Mother's Earth. As she dressed up in a green garment, he rolled this terrestrial ball into space, baptized it with a liquid mist, laid out the green carpets of the earth, tapped it down with daffodils and snapdragons, lilies, roses, and trees. 
He ordered a variety of blooming flowers and transfigured them into a marvelous attraction. Praise God, the one that deferred the counsel of the Holy Trinity and organized an angelic host to furnish music while the glory of his father flooded the hills of Bethlehem. Step down on a heavenly made airplane, roll down in a low ground of sorrow, leaped into the Virgin Mary, and was born one day in the city of David, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Thank God who makes me walk like I'm rich and I don't have a dime in the bank. Praise God who allows me to sleep on a pillow of peace and cushion of confidence. He can open doors no man can shut. And if I'm running a little late, he'll hold it till I get there. Praise God. He's our rock, our strength, our hope, our God, our peace, our life, our salvation, our Lord, our Savior, our all in all. Praise God who said to the triumph, let's make man and the word leaped into action and God stooped down, gathered dust together, piled it up on the earth, molded it and made it like he wanted it. And when he was satisfied with what he had made by his own hands, he stood it up, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. This is why we praise God from whom all blessings flow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We praise your name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We praise God from whom all blessings flow. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Eternal God, we praise you for whom all blessings flow. We praise you, God, for being our creator, and we praise you, God, for the love that you share with us every day through your Holy Spirit. God, we invoke again your presence and the illumination of your word as it's read this morning, that it serves as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Speak now that your servants may hear, move in a way that we will all leave better than we came. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, we pray. Amen. To God be the glory, great things God has done, and what God moves, and how God moves in our lives. Today, I invite you to turn in your word to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 14, reading verses 22 through 36 from a NIV translation of the word. For let us hear God's word, and let us receive God's word as a blessing this Sunday morning. For the Bible says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, If it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You were little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, 
truly you are the son of God. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick, ju sick just touch the edge of his cloak. And all who touched him were healed. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I'll call your attention to verse 30 of this pericope, for it serves as the text and the starting block from where we preach today. For the Bible says, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. With the aid of the Holy Spirit, I want to lift up this text and for a brief moment today, would like to preach on a subject close enough to be saved. Close enough to be saved. In 2002, Leonard Sweet wrote a book entitled Out of the Question in shares the story that while Chaplain Wiles picked him up at the Phoenix airport to take him to be the keynote speaker at a leadership conference at the university, they rode uh, in his new pickup truck. That is, Chaplain Wiles had a, a new 2002 Ford uh, F-10 pickup. And, and Dr. Sweet said he admired the truck so much so that he could not help but to share his admiration for his uh, now departed Dodge pickup truck. And as truck drivers would do, they shared interesting stories and enamored one another about being a truck driver, agreeing on this that nothing is more beautiful than a man and his truck. Dr. Sweet said that on the following day as he climbed back into Chaplin's truck to ride back to the airport, he noticed a bent dent and some scratches by the passenger's door. What happened here, he asked, and the chaplain said, my neighbor's basketball goal fell and left a big dent and scratches on the side door. Oh, no, man, you're kidding. How awful can that be? This truck is so good and new, it even smells new. And, and, and when, what's even worse, the chaplain said, is my neighbor doesn't feel responsible for the damages. Being being floored by this response, Dr. Sweet then asked, well, did you contact your insurance company and just how are you going to get your neighbor to pay for the damages? And y'all, here is what the chaplain said. He says, this has been a real spiritual journey for me. After a lot of soul searching and discussion with my wife about hiring an, hiring an attorney, it, it came down to this. I can either be in the right or I can be in relationship with my neighbor. And since my neighbor will probably be around longer than this truck, I decided I'd rather be in a relationship than be in the right. Besides, Trucks are meant to be banged up anyhow. And mine got its initiation in the real world a little bit earlier than I expected. Can I come get you this morning? Because I don't want you to miss Chaplain Wilde's epiphany because when it boils down to what is real and what's most important, he said, I can either be in the right or I can be in relationship with my neighbor. And since my neighbor will probably be around longer than this truck, I decided I'd rather be in a relationship than be right. And you see, y'all, that's somebody's word today because God, our creator, and God, our sustainer, and God, our redeemer, and God, our savior, is calling you and calling me to be in relationship with one another. Somebody say amen. 
Church, God is calling us to cooperate and not compete. God is calling us to compliment and not complain. God is calling us to build up and not tear down. God is calling us to support and not separate. God, our Lord, the one who made the heavens and the earth is calling all created beings to study his word and to follow his son, Jesus Christ, who needs partners in ministry, partners who are pure in their motives, careful in their choices, considerate in their business, clean in their feelings, partners who are truthful in their thoughts, sincere in their love, righteous in their conduct, and warm in their friendships, partners in ministry who are faithful in their service, liberal in their giving, earnest in their efforts, and mature in their manner. God is calling partners who are humble in their attitude, pleasing in their personality, patient in their trials, and submissive in their wills. In essence, God is calling people who will be strong in their faith. And church, this morning as we come out of the starting blocks with this sermon, in essence, God is calling us simply to stay close enough to be saved. Let me say that again. God is calling the body of Christ to stay close enough to God's word, particularly in these tough times, to be saved. And my friends, that's exactly where we roll up on this text because the Bible tells us in verse 30, as Peter finds himself in the midst of a storm, finds himself being moved by the waves, he begins to sink, but he cries out, Lord, save me. And the word says immediately Jesus reached out his hand and, and lifted Peter up, caught him from drowning. You see, when you uncover the biblical lessons and the, main, and the mandate from the commandments of this text, we are simply invited to be close enough to God to be saved. And please, y'all, don't go too quickly to, to be in Holy Ghost field and fire baptized and speaking in tongues and casting out demons, being a holy roller. I, I, I do want to talk about being saved, but, but before we get there, if the truth be told, some of us need to confess to God and say this morning, Lord, we need to be saved from ourselves. Some of us need to confess this morning, Lord, save us from our foolish thoughts and save us from stinking thinking and save us from destructive behavior and save us from self-inflicted pain and save us from remembering and holding on to stuff that's old, tired, and ain't worth the time of day anyhow. We, we need to be saved from thinking that we know everything and that we are always right. We need to be saved from drinking too much and eating too much and smoking too much and shopping too much and talking too much and watching too much television, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, WSOC, WBTV, Netflix, Spectrum, do I need to go on? Simply you need to cut it off and cut on the word of Almighty God. You need to be saved, close enough to be saved. You see, y'all, the story of our text begins in verse 22. For after feeding 5,000 men, not counting women and children, the Bible says that Jesus sent the crowd away and he sent his disciples away. He did so, y'all, so that he could have some time alone with God in prayer. The time that Jesus spent alone with God in prayer was important, y'all, because he Jesus' cousin had been beheaded, and Jesus still hadn't had time to mourn the loss of his cousin. So this time in prayer was a time for him to lift up and a time for him to be present in the, in, in, in the praise of Almighty God. This should be a message for somebody this morning to spend some intentional time with God in prayer. This should be a message for somebody who is going 
going through a trial and a tribulation to have some Sabbath time. Again, have some rest time. Again, spend some intentional time with the Lord. The Bible, the Bible lets it be known that as Jesus has sovereign control of the situation, he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him. And I don't want you to, those who are new to the faith, to miss this because though the disciples were commissioned to go ahead of Jesus, they were going into a storm. The text teaches us, y'all, that though they were in God's perfect will, they were about to enter a perfect storm. Don't miss that. They were in God's perfect will, but they were about to go into a storm. Indicating, church, that obeying God can sometimes lead to some rough sailing. Have I got a witness? But nevertheless, faithfulness in rough waters gets you to your divine destination. Somebody ought to give your neighbor a high five right there because that's a shouting word because faithfulness in your rough waters will indeed get you to your divine destination. You've heard me say it before. You've got to go through some things to get to your destination. You see, don't forget the pretext for the context of this sermon. Jesus had just performed the miracle of feeding the 5,000. And along with this great miracle came success. Success for Jesus in his ministry. But let me pause and give some precautionary warnings for handling success. Because if the truth be told, for the Christian, for the believer, it should never be about success. It has to always be about faith and bearing fruit. Let me say that again. It should never be about success, but about faithfulness and bearing fruit. And, and the precautionary warning I want to give you, first of all, is success and prosperity are two things that, can, that are extremely dangerous if a person is not spiritually healthy. Be careful when God blesses you if you're not healthy enough spiritually to handle it. It'll go to your head. Number two, success uh, uh, and prosperity often causes people to live with their heads in the air and their feet off the ground. We have to thank God for blessing us, but never forget God that God blesses us to be a blessing. Don't be so heavenly bound, you ain't no earthly good. Number three, y'all, is success and prosperity often causes people to take their focus off God and place it on themselves. You see, this is why Jesus, after feeding 5,000 men, not counting women and children, we say, some would say up to 1,500 with two fish and five loaves of bread. This is how he is going to renew himself to stay focused on the will of Almighty God. Jesus did more than just pray on top of the mountain for the disciples. He came to them walking on the sea, y'all, in the fourth watch of the night. Jesus used the storm as a pathway to get the disciples to draw closer to him. The storm that we read about in the text, y'all, is keeping the disciples from their desired destination. But here it is, it is not stopping Jesus from getting to the disciples. Let me say that again. The storm was keeping the disciples away from getting to their destination. But it was not keeping Jesus from getting to them. I like the way the Bishop Jake says it. He says, don't make the mistake, uh, uh, the, the, don't mistake the presence of the storm to indicate the absence of God. Somebody needs to be affirming your faith this Sunday morning because if you find yourself in a storm, don't, don't mistake the presence of the storm to say that God is not there. God made the storm. And if God made the storm, God knows how to get you out of the storm. This should be a message that, that the storms of life may, may try to stop us and slow us down from getting to our desired destination, but it cannot keep Jesus, our Lord and Savior, from getting to us. 
Y'all, Jesus always comes to us when we need him the most. I like the way that Pastor George Brooks says it. He, he records it like this. He says, when you are the neediest, he is the most sufficient. When you are completely helpless, he is the most helpful. When you feel totally dependent, he's absolutely dependable. When you are the weakest, he is the most able. When you are the most alone, he is intimately present. When, when you feel you are the least, he is the greatest. When you feel the most useless, he is preparing you. And get this, y'all, when you are most humble, he is most gracious. The good news of the text, y'all, it helps us realize that in the midst of the disciples' distress, Jesus came toward them walking on the sea. What does that say about our faith? Here it is. Faith is always obedience to something Jesus said. Faith is always being obedient. The Bible says this, it, 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 it's better to be obedient than to sacrifice. The battering waves were the problem. That's exactly what Jesus walked on. The storm that the disciples felt, y'all, that's what Jesus walked on. You're not getting this. The thing that tried to tear the disciples' life up, that's what Jesus stepped in the midst and he began to control. When, 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 when the disciples disciples panicked, y'all, thinking that it was a ghost. He comforted them with the word and addressed their circumstance. And I like it, y'all, because when Peter did what no one else would do, he, he, he asked permission to join Jesus in the midst of the storm. Peter didn't want to merely be protected from his troubles. He wanted to experience something with Jesus he had never dreamed of possible. I, I, I got to drop my kickstand right there because that is exactly what the church of Jesus Christ is experiencing right now. We had no idea that we would be the outreach, the outpost to the community. No idea that people would raid their own pantries and bring food to the church for the very least of these. We had no idea that folk would sacrifice their breakfast and their lunch and make sandwiches and give those food items to people in the community, but that's how God works. We, we should not be discouraged. We should not be despondent in this pandemic. God is doing an extremely marvelous thing in all of us. You see, Jesus invited Peter forward, and this bold disciple started walking. And what's important to recognize is when Peter lost focus on Jesus and gave attention to the strength of the wind, he became afraid and started to sink. It's at that moment when he took his eyes off the one in the storm and he focused on the storm that he began to sink. You see, Matthew records this story, y'all, that is so critical to us. It's not the story of Jesus being in the belly of the boat and the storm comes up and he says, peace, be still. It's not the story in Mark when, when the disciples see Jesus walking on the water. Matthew says, now I'm going to show you that Christ walks on the water, on the storms of your life, and you too can come and walk on that same water, on that same storm. Before Peter began to look down, he, he had to look up to Almighty God. You see, before you look down on Brother Peter, y'all, don't forget there were 11 other disciples in the boat who could have walked on the water as I don't know who I'm talking to, but don't be so quick and to throw a stone at individuals who start out the gate excited in their faith and have a relapse because the shot the gun or the starting gun is for everybody to walk on the water. The other disciples, they just stared, but Peter stepped out in faith. I got to give a shout out to the Peters in this congregation and a shout out to the Peters in the community who are doing extremely uh, extraordinary things. Those who are delivering meals again, Deacon Jerry, I give a shout out for the meal ministry you're doing. I give a shout out to Mama Gwen and all of those who come to the church and deliver food to those brothers and sisters living in the tent. You, you are the Peters who are stepping out 
in faith doing extraordinary things. Peter's cry, y'all, got hold of Jesus. For Jesus simply was there for Peter. But y'all don't miss it. Jesus, Peter was close enough for Jesus to catch. You see, we think that, that Peter just got out of the boat initially, but recognized when he saw Jesus on the water and he began to walk toward him, that is when he kept his eyes on Jesus. But it's not that Jesus was so far away from Peter that when he began to go down that Jesus had to run up and catch him. Peter was so close to Jesus that all he had to do was call out to him and Jesus reached out and helped. Okay, let me see if I can help you this Sunday morning. You see, the text is trying to help us see the name or the title of the sermon close enough to be saved. Uh, you got to realize when you're close enough to be saved, that means you have a close walk with the Lord. When you're close enough to be saved, you have a relationship with Almighty God. When you're close enough to be saved, it's in verse 28 through 30 that Peter said to him, Lord, if it's you, come to me. Uh, I want to walk on the water. And Jesus simply says, come. When you're close enough to be saved, you will hear the word of Almighty God. When you're close enough to be saved, you will hear the shepherd speak to you and say, weep and endures for a night, but your joy comes in the morning. When you're close enough to be saved, you know that all things are possible to those that believe. When you're close enough to be saved, you don't have to worry about, is it static? Did I lose my connection? My internet is down? I can't get through? No, when you're close enough to be saved, all you have to say is, Lord, have mercy mercy on me. C close enough to be saved, it helps us realize, y'all, is that we should not be so aware of the storm that we lose the awareness of God in the storm. We should not be so focused on the storms of life that we lose the awareness of God who is with us in the storm. Let me see if I can move quickly because I want you to get what the text says. Again, faith is always obedience in something that Jesus said. Jesus said what? Come. And Peter, in his faith, got out of the boat and walked toward the Lord. Jesus said, come. And Peter, not just the other 11, but the one in the boat, oh, big mouth Peter who denies Christ, oh, Peter who, who cuts off the, uh, the, the soldier's ear at the night of Jesus' crucifixion, Peter the one who, who was not there to say, I'm with you. He was not at the cross when Jesus was crucified, but at this moment, Peter steps out in faith and walks on the water. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus becomes the focus of Peter and I just want to give three things and help you understand what the Bible is letting us know. Peter is speaking to us today because what's different about Peter walking on the water and what's different about him when he goes down is that when Peter is in the boat, that's verse 26, uh, Peter was focused on his condition. But when he is on the water in verse 26, 30, he has to focus on Christ. You see, Peter had one thing going for him in verse 26 that he did not have in verse 30. In verse 26, Peter was in the boat. In verse 30, he was being bounced in the water. In verse 26, he was in a man-made obstacle. In verse 30, he was in God-inspired opportunity. In verse 26, he was resting in familiarity. In verse 30, he was required to move by faith. In verse 26, the outcome is unpredictable. In verse 30, his miracle was unprecedented. And the bottom line, y'all, is that this simply means that we got to get out of the boat in the verse 26 of our lives and there is no turning back. There is no stepping down. There is no wish I would have, could have, should have staying captive in Egypt land. But God is calling this ministry and God is calling you to step out. Move away from your comfort zone and your verse 26 in your life and begin to look with faith and follow God in the verse 30s of your miracles. 
Here, here, here's what the text teaches us, and, and I will give it to you quickly. That's, that, now that is an oxymoron for preachers in the church when they say, I'm going to give it to you quickly. That just simply means that's 20 more minutes, but let me give it to you in an abbreviated way. Amen, light. Here it is, here it is, here it is. You've got to have the kind of faith, the kind of faith that, as Dr. Martin Luther King says, faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. You've got to have the kind of faith like Peter that moves in a direction that I don't know all of what's going to happen. I do know what's happening right now and lessons that we learn from Peter on staying close to God is the first lesson is the recognition of the divinity of Jesus the first thing that I don't want you to miss in the text is that Peter recognizes the divinity the the Godhead that's in Jesus for they think it's a ghost, but then somebody says, no, that is Christ. And, and what does Jesus simply say? Like God spoke to Moses when Moses said, who do you say that I am? Tell him who I am. And God just simply say, just tell him I am. So whatever it takes, you need to recognize in your storm that the divinity of Christ says, I am. I am the one that overcome. I am the one that delivers. I am the one that lifts up. I am the one that heals. I am the one that you can call on in your moment of crisis. Peter recognized the divinity of God and the first word is the recognition of the divinity wherever you may be. The second word is the recognition of the power of Jesus. God is there in the person of Jesus and Peter says if it is you Christ command that I come forward there is power in the word of almighty God there is power in the lifting up of God's name there is power in the blood of Jesus Christ there, it, what can wash away my sins nothing but the blood of Jesus Peter recognizes that God has all power in God's hand the third word that I don't want you to miss in this text the lesson from Peter is that the, the, that there is there is a personal request of deliverance from Christ a personal request that Peter is saying Lord save me and what's important y'all when you stay close to God and you're praying to God and you're believing in God you have that personal relationship with the Lord when you are on your knees and not on the phone when you are lifting holy hands and not raising hell when you focus on the truth and not on the lie you can say beyond a shadow of a doubt Lord save me it's not my mama not my sister but it's me oh Lord standing in the need of of prayer the, the say me the pronoun in the Greek is the first person singular pronoun Peter was not crying out to Jesus for the sake of the other 11 in the boat he was saying right now I need to be saved right now I need a relationship right now I need you to wash away my sins Jesus don't fail me Jesus help me out Jesus be with me I'm in the midst of a storm I need you to save me Peter was crying out to Jesus to deliver him from the destruction of this danger. And the good news, y'all, is because Peter was so close to God, not only did he get saved, but look at the text. It says at that moment, then the other disciples said, surely that must be the Son of God. Surely that must be the Messiah. Surely that must be the one that we've been working and believing in. Surely if he can walk on the water, and make old big mouth Peter walk on the water and save him in the midst of his destruction. Surely that's my God. And the Bible says they worship. They worship. And, and, and I was just about ready to give my amen benediction right there until I kept on reading and I was saying, why in the world did we select to read all the way to verse 36 of this text? And I understand why, because the Bible says, verse 34, when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. And the Bible says, and when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word out surrounding the country and people brought their sick to him 
and begged him just to let the sick touch the edge of his cloak. And whoever touched him was, you know, what that said to me was that when you're close enough to God, sometimes other folk can be touched by Jesus because of your close walk to the Lord. When you are walking close to the Lord and close enough to be saved, sometimes, somehow, God will use somebody else and use your testimony, use your witness to bring somebody you might not even know to be close enough to the Lord. And, 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 and the saving grace is, is, I got it from that old James Cleveland song, Lord, help me to hold out. Lord, I'm like Peter because I know sometimes I, I, I take my eyes off of you. So, Lord, I need you to help me to hold out. Lord, I need you to step in when I step out. I need you to wrap your arms around me when I let go of you. God, I just want to stay close enough to you to, for you to hold me when I slip. Lord, help me to hold out. Hold out until my change is come. Help me to hold out, Lord. My, my way may not be easy. You did not say it would be, but when it gets dark and I can't see my way, you told me to put my trust in the Lord. Help me to hold out. Help me to hold out in the pandemic. Help me to hold out in the stay at home. Help me to hold out and put my mask on so I don't give it to nobody else and they don't give it to Lord. Help me to hold out as I reach back and try to be a living example, as I try to practice what I preach. Help me to hold out, Lord, when the weight gets too heavy on me. God, give me strength until my change is going to come this opportunity that the church grows. Again, we're not a building. We are a body of believers. We're grateful today for Pastor Veronica and leading us in prayer. We're thankful for our musicians, Dr. Monroe and Joy for Noise, we call them, our band. We're grateful for our technician, the Deacon Donna, as our, as our program, our floor manager, and for all of those, our technicians who make this a great production for Dr. Carroll and Pastor Lanson, our online virtual pastors, do know that our youth, there's a program that comes up right after 11 o'clock. Go to the website with that information. For our children, there's one that comes up right after 12. And so there's a way for you to stay connected. Youth, children, young adults, Bible studies, all of those things are right there posted on our website. Again, on behalf of all the officers and members of this church, we want to thank you for being a part of worship today for our mission project. Yes, we want to make 500 masks, and we're going to give them out. So if you have a need, let us know. But if you want to contribute, call your friends all over the world. Tell them that C and Jenkins, we're going to make masks and give those out. I love you in the name of the Lord. I pray for you, and I ask that God's blessing be upon you this week. Keep on holding on. Stay close enough to God. Stay close enough to God until your change has come. Unto him is able to keep you and unto him is able to bless you. May God's glory, may God's love, may God's saving grace be with you this day and forevermore. God bless you. I love you. Have a wonderful week. In the name of our Savior, we'll see you next week.